Uh, usually with um, winter quarter, uh, the last meeting is usually a time of uh, where we welcome in some new officers. But also, we have to say goodbye to a couple. Sam and Ben, would you guys like to say anything? Or we can say something for them first. Yeah. So sad. Hey, okay, yeah. So um, I guess I can say a few words. Um, you know, a game dev club, I feel, is uh, it's a community that has been touched by many people over the years. We've had many influential uh, members of the club up, up at the top. You can see a couple, maybe even recognize some. Uh, yeah, but over the years, we've had um, we've had just a lot of characters um, join the club, be a part of it, contribute to the community. Um, and Sam and Ben are no exceptions. Um, you know, it's no understatement to say that uh, the club wouldn't be what it is today without either of them. Uh, we need, you know, their contributions to the club, their uh, their participation, their enthusiasm for it, um, and the amazing things that they've made along the way uh, inspire and I hope continue to inspire all of us um, uh, as we continue on our journey through college, right? Um, it's, I don't know, th th these are always just so sad and emotional for me, but like, I, I, I can't put into words, um, you know, how much I looked up to, I continue to look up to um, their enthusiasm uh, and continued interest in game dev as a medium uh, and their knowledge and um, just ability to make amazing things with it. Um, so, and speaking to the to their roles as officers, um, they've both been very proactive and helpful members uh, on the officer team. And they've really helped shoulder the burden and help this club adjust to the, uh, to the tumultuous period that we've been going through this past year. Uh, and once again, I, I just couldn't have done it without them. Nobody could have. Um, so we, we, I'm, I just want to express my express my whole wholehearted um, appreciation for everything that they've done, uh, and I wish them the best now that they are graduating from Utah and moving on to their next endeavors. So thank you very much, Sam, and thank you very much, Ben, for your time as officers here. I'm giving you a virtual hug right now. Love you, Sam. Likewise, thank you. All right. Collapse. Yeah. So. It's not very great on my. Yeah. It, it's always sad to see um, old guards go the go the way we all do eventually. Last quarter at UW, we all finish up. Um, but yeah, on that note, we also we also always have um, new people stepping up to the plate to uh, take their place and continue on. Uh, the spirit of the club. So, without further ado, oh, we have some new officers to introduce to you all. All right. And I think so, the first one coming up, I believe, is Roberto. Roberto. Yep, that's me, Gatraga Talk, uh, aka yeah, Roberto. Um, I don't actually use any social media, uh, so if you need to contact me, just do it over Discord. Um, anyways, so uh, yeah, I have a. <sighs> Um, I guess a little bit of history about me. Uh, if you've seen the bottom right, you see that big Washington thing. Uh, I was part of a, in high school, I was part of a club called Washington TSA, which is the Washington Technology Student Association. Basically, it was like some sort of big contest with a bunch of different, uh, with a bunch of different like sub contests or categories that you could participate in. Uh, and they're all related to technology in some way. Uh, Sorry, um, I, uh, the one that I was uh, interested in was uh, video game design one. So I was like, hey, you know, might as well do that. And uh, yeah, uh, I did that uh, for <laughs> four years. And um, every year I progressively got better at it. And then I uh, think during my third year, I found out about uh, this club.
And um, yeah, I, I eventually decided to go to UW and I came here. And uh, yeah. Um, All right. All right. Awesome. Um, so welcome aboard, Roberto. Uh, we're glad to have you. And um, yeah, thanks. Um, shall we move? Yeah. Who's up next? Next is, uh, how do you pronounce your name? Yeah. <laughs> and and Namit. And, Namit. Or, okay. Yeah, it's fine. Uh, so I'm, I'm Namit, and I've been in the game dev club since uh, my freshman year, which was in 2018, but only now applied for the officer role. And very glad to be like, uh, have this role, like, because, you know, we all love game dev here. It's, it's fun. And so on the slide, as you can see, there's a few things about me. And at the bottom right, uh, those are the things that I use to make games. Uh, I, I prefer Unreal Engine, unlike most of the people here who use Unity and Asaprite and Blender, of course. I've been recently trying to uh, make pix uh, 3D games, but using pixel art, which is kind of difficult, but um, that's what I've been trying to do. And I watch a lot of anime uh, and maybe a bit too much. So that's that. And in terms of games that I play, mostly Overwatch and the other games are on the top right. And in case, <laughs> okay, shine. In case you wanna uh, contact me, then of course Discord is the best way. And if you wanna just add me on Steam or Blizzard, those IDs are at the bottom right. And if you wanna play Overwatch, sure, I'll, I'll play with you all. And I also stream on <laughs> Twitch uh, every single day, so that's the thing. And uh, yeah, looking, looking really like really looking forward to uh, d like give presentations and everything and make games. Cool. Do you, do you stream Overwatch or something? Yes, I do stream Overwatch. Cool. Yeah. Glad to have you aboard. And finally, and lastly, yeah, we have one more. We have Arif. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Arif. Uh, it's currently like in the morning uh, where I come from. I'm from Hong Kong. Um, uh, my favorite anime, I, I watch a lot of anime like Namit, but my favorite anime of all time is Cowboy Bebop. I feel like the art style is like super unique. The storyline is amazing. So I love Cowboy Bebop. Um, I enjoy creating pixel art. And that's one of my uh, greatest passions is just creating art. And um, I recently picked up uh, how to use pixel art, but um, I've been like an artist for uh, quite a long time. Uh, one of my favorite games is uh, Civ, Civ V. That's really, really fun. Um, I like um, strategy games in general. Um, I also like Stardew Valley. Um, farming Sims have been uh, really fun for me as well. Um, here's my Steam ID as well. I usually play CSGO, but um i'm also open to try out new games but yeah thanks okay uh, yeah and then that's that's really it yeah welcome that's to it. the team everybody those are all the changes we made to the officer docket um oh, mash every every quarter or i guess not every quarter but every time we have to do this it's always um it's always a big change uh, we don't make it lightly, but you know, the show must go on. And I'm very excited uh, for all the things that we'll be able to accomplish uh, with the new people we're bringing on. Um, they show a lot of promise and enthusiasm for game dev, uh, and I couldn't ask for anything more. So thank you, everyone. Um, yeah, before we move on, can I make like one last uh, thing? One sure. last statement? Yeah, I just want to say, like, um, just like for, for Sam and Ben, all right, I just want to say like one last thing. Was, yeah, well, I was like psyching myself up, but like, yeah, um, like Sam, like you're probably like ugh, my biggest inspiration to this club, honestly. Uh, like every game jam, I feel like you constantly pumped out good quality stuff, and I was just like, oh my god, this guy's unstoppable. I was just like, 
it was inspiring to me. I just, I just kept seeing you bake stuff all the time. I was like, oh my god, you're so busy. You keep making cool stuff. And it was like every time you did, you just pushed the envelope, and I thought that was really cool. Um, and Ben, I wish you got to stay around longer. I feel like whenever we interacted, you're just such a cool dude. I think uh, all the music stuff you know is just super cool. I just really wish you could stay longer, but it is what it is. But yeah, I'll, I'll miss you guys, and uh, I'm glad you guys were part of the team. Yeah, I'm sorry. I gotta. Thanks, Thomas. Yes, it's all it's good. Bro. All right, yeah, but uh, we got to move on, All right? So um, from here on, uh, we have a guest speaker. We have Wyatt. Hello. All right, and then you can take it over from here. All right, share screen. <laughs> that one, go live. I did it. You can see my uh, GPU, AKA my screen. Yes, we can. Uh, yep. I saw some yep. pedant on Twitter who was like, I can't see your screen, actually. I just see your GPU output. So I'm trying to, to be a hip and cool with it. Anyway, hello. Um, so this is my talk on um, the MDA framework. Um, the This is adapted from a white paper written by, um, uh, let's see if I get the names right, uh, Robert Zubek, Mark LeBlanc, and Robin, Hun Robin Hunicki. Um, it's a, a really interesting paper. It's quite short. I do recommend you read it, but um, I have it adapted to a little bit more of a digestible format here. Uh, but if you enjoy this talk, then you should definitely check out the paper. Um, so, oops, let me click into focus. Here we go. So what's the plan? So uh, first I'm gonna introduce myself, which I started to do a little bit, but I'll go a little bit more into detail there. Um, I'm going to explain the MDA framework, and in doing that, I will explain. I will give a formal definition for mechanics, dynamics, and aesthetics. Um, and then I we're going to break down a game using the MDA framework, and then I'm going to talk about how to design a game using MDA, just in general, how you can use this for uh, future projects or game jams or whatever. Um, Okay, so uh, who is this nerd? Uh, so I am the former Game Design Club president, but not at this Game Design Club, at the uh, WWU kind of sister club to this one. Um, we started entirely independent of each other, and we discovered each other years into our existence and found we were the same club. It was hilarious. It was great. I don't know if anyone who was there at the time is still here for that discovery, but it was... It was... Uh, what was there? Huh? <laughs> Camera was there. Camera was there. Um, yeah, so uh, I used to run that game design club. I graduated from WVU in 2018 with a BS in computer science. I am now a senior engineer at a um, nondescript company, but it's the one who just bought Slack. You can look it up. Um, and I'm an avid game jammer. That's I've done 10 game jams at WVU. I've done four Lunum Diaries, two global game jams, one GMTK jam, and a triple tri jam, and probably some others, but these are just the ones that I can like actually count. So I've, I've, done, I've done a few game jams. Um, all right, so this is the original definition of MDA. Um, when I, yeah, it's Salesforce. You've, <laughs> you found it. Um, this is the original definition of MDA from the paper. Um, when I did this talk uh, to a group before, they recommended that I provide the original definition. So here it is. Um, I'm not gonna read it out. Well, I guess I can read it out. Just, to, but it's it's quite wordy and like kind of doesn't get to the point, uh, in my opinion. But so. Mechanics describe the particular components of the game at the level at the level of data representation and algorithms. Dynamics describe the runtime behavior of the mechanics acting on the player's input and each other's outputs over time. And aesthetics describe the desirable emotional response invoked in the player when she interacts with the game system. Uh, they're very progressive. They say she as their pronoun. It's very cool. Um, so here's what my kind of synthesis of that, which I think is a lot more digestible. So mechanics are the rules of the game. Uh, these rules could be lines of code, they could be like the written rules, et cetera. Dynamics are the behaviors that the players do as a result of those mechanics and, the, uh, or, and also the behaviors of the game itself, of the system, um, as a result of those mechanics and the player's interaction with the system. Aesthetics are the emotional response the players get back from the experience. So like, are they having fun? Are they sad? Are they excited? That, that is sort of the aesthetics. Um, and we'll, we'll get more into detail for each of these. So mechanics, I feel like 
you kind of probably already know what mechanics are, but this is you know, just as so we can have a formal definition. So mechanics are the constraints and affordances given by the rules. And like I said, the rules might be lines of code. They could be physically written rules in like the rule book or the player's handbook or whatever, um, or just a verbally understood contract. Like you could have a, a game that is entirely, the rules are entirely verbally expressed. Um, if it's not obvious at this point, when I say game, I'm not talking about necessarily a digital game. I'm talking about literally anything you might call a game. Um, these rules are, these mechanics are usually prescribed by the designer. Um, although players, the line gets kind of blurry when you talk about like house rules and speed running and modding, because like the players are kind of acting as the designer, but they're still being the players. So like, but typically they're prescribed by the designer. The designer chooses what mechanics are in the game. Um, and this is a little bit philosophical and it'll make sense in a moment, but mechanics exist whether the game is being played or not. So a game has mechanics even if the game is not being played. Um, so a way you can sort of think about what is and is not a mechanic is like if there is a button that does that thing, it's a mechanic. You know, you shoot in Mega Man, that's a mechanic. You press X to Jason, that's a mechanic. Um, there are other things that are a little bit, the line gets a little blurrier, but we'll get into that when we talk about dynamics, which is right now. So dynamics, unlike mechanics, only occur when the game is played. They happen at runtime. Um, now, uh, runtime is like, that's a computer science concept. So like, you know, if we're talking about just games in general, it's like at play time, I guess. But yeah, they happen while the game is being played. Um, and the dynamics are what the human being who is playing the game actually does when they play the game. Um, so like the mechanics is what they can do, the dynamics is what they actually do. Um, and these are expressed in like, what are they incentivized to do? What is their goal? What are they thinking about? Where are they looking? Stuff like that. Um, so this can include just the actual like learning how to play the game, the, 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 uh, the tutorial or just the, they play the game for the first time and they're discovering how to play. This also includes for the more advanced players, like the meta, like what is the right way to play the game, et cetera. That is all on the dynamic level. There's no inbuilt right way to play the game. There's just the way that players agree is the right way to play the game. Um, and this also differs pretty dramatically player to player. So um, for instance, if you uh, play Super Smash Brothers, like that might be a game you play just to you know, hang out with your friends as an activity to do together and like, the act, the things you do in that game might be stuff like, oh, you you know, break the smash ball and you you throw capsules or whatever, you throw pokeballs or whatever you you play with items on. Like, you know, that might be your experience and that's your dynamics when you play the game. However, to like a pro player, a dynamic might be something like wave dashing. Um, I guess you can make the case that wave dashing is a mechanic because it all is as a consequence of all the systems that are in the game, but. I would say it's a dynamic because it's something that players discovered and like players uh, like requires very precise and specific inputs to execute on. But that's we're splitting hairs at that point. Another great example of uh, dynamic is something like camping in a first-person shooter. Uh, like we talked about Counter Strike earlier, uh, there is no camping mechanic. You don't press X to camp. Camping is this emergent thing that happens out of the fact that like okay, well we have this open space. And there's no consequence for sitting still, really. I mean, there there is, but like no direct like the game doesn't punish you for it directly. Um, and like you have this strategy that just tends to work when playing with people at certain skill levels. So like that's that's an example of a dynamic. It's it's a thing that players do, not necessarily a thing that's prescribed by the game. And then one little further up, aesthetics. Aesthetics you can sort of think of as the type of fun you're having when you play the game. Um, you can think of aesthetics as like a more precise uh, concept of a genre. Like that's one way to use aesthetics. It's not like the, this is a, a, a benefit of aesthetics is that it sort of first serves as a better version of genre. Because um, when you think about genre, it's really about like what mechanics the game has. Like uh, uh, as an example of a genre of like first person shooter, it's like, okay, so the game has a first person camera and there is shooting involved. It's like, okay, well that describes Fallout. It also describes Halo. It also describes portal like those are all first person shooters but like they have very different audiences and people enjoy them for very different reasons whereas aesthetics are sort of why would someone play this game why do people enjoy this game um, because people play games for a reason right like that's 
why they're playing them. It's sort of like a self-fulfilling prophecy. People play games because they want to play games. So like, why do they want to play the game? Um, I might be getting too meta. Um, so uh, aesthetics can be sort of broken down as these sort of discrete individual things that are, uh, are in the right in this white box here. I can't find my cursor. There it is. I found it. Um, so, uh, you know, an example of an aesthetic would be like challenge. <laughs> um, that the, uh, you play a game just because you want an obstacle course. You want something that is hard so that way you can overcome that hard thing and you can feel good for overcoming it. Dark Souls, perfect example. Um, or another example of an aesthetic would be like self-expression. You want something that gives you the tools to create and curate your own experience and create your own thing, you know, whether that thing is like your character or creating a world or creating a house, like anything that has like customization sort of ex exercises this expression aesthetic. Um, and you'll find that like as a player, you probably have certain aesthetics that you value higher than others. Uh, like that's just kind of goes with sort of your personality and your sort of like the kind of person you are, I guess that's what personality means. Um, and uh, certain games will definitely like nail certain aesthetics, like higher and lower in certain categories. And some games will nail multiple aesthetics at once. And those games tend to have very broad appeal because they offer something to like very disparate groups of people. Um, so like an example, uh, it's like a game like Tetris is very much um, like, it's, it's you know, definitely somewhat of that obstacle horse, like challenge aesthetic, but I would say the Tetris's main forte is that submission aesthetic, game as pastime, which is essentially this is a game you play just because you want to just kill time. You're 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 waiting in line at the grocery store, so you're gonna play a couple of rounds of Tetris, or like you're on your lunch break and you just want to not think about school or work right now. Let's, let's play some Tetris. Um, whereas a game like Super Liminal, if you have not played it, it's a puzzle game that's like yeah, it's kind of like Portal, I guess broadly speaking, in that it has like one really interesting mechanic and like it kind of creates a bunch of puzzles that use this one interesting mechanic and like little different different variants on it. Um, and like, you know, so it has that sort of obstacle coursey, like, oh, I want like something that'll be, that'll, it's gonna like bend my brain and kind of like make me think about things differently. Um, but it also has a story that if you ask anyone who's played it, the story is kind of not, not like amazing. Um, so, like it, it it tries to reach this narrative aesthetic, but like maybe doesn't do the greatest job of it. Um, so like that's this is to say that like you can have um, a um, like you can attempt to reach an aesthetic and do it poorly, and like that that is not to say that like let's see how to, how am I trying to say? You can reach these things at different levels. Is I guess what I'm what I'm saying is that that just because you have something, it's not a binary system. It's not a checklist. It's about how much of the experience is that thing? OK. So mechanics give rise to dynamics, which give rise to aesthetics. So of these three things I've talked about, there is sort of a hierarchy that, that mechanics are at the base level, and dynamics are at the middle level, and aesthetics are at the higher level. So here's a diagram that sort of describes that. And this is sort of MDA the diagram. This is kind of everything explained in one picture, kind of. Um, so. Uh, like we talked about before, we have the mechanics, which are directly prescribed by the designer. Like as if you are writing the, you know, the rule book for your game, like you are exactly writing what the mechanics are. Um, if you are programming a digital game, like you're writing code, and that code is defining what the mechanics are uh, very explicitly. Um, with those mechanics, someone will play your game, and they will interact with it, and then the dynamics will fall out. Right, but you don't really know what the dynamics are going to be until someone actually sits down and plays your game and you see it firsthand. Um, and you can sort of indirectly prescribe what the dynamics will be by playing with player psychology, like you know, drawing their attention to certain things, trying to persuade them to do certain things, um, incentivizing certain things. There's ways you can kind of nudge dynamics along, but they are pretty much at the hands of the player of what the player actually chooses to do with it. If they choose to stare at a wall the entire time. Like that's their experience. That's their that is their dynamic, and you can't do anything about that. Um, and then aesthetics is like even further like removed from like your purview of control. Is like how they feel about the experience, which is dictated by what they do, which is dictated by what the game is. So like uh, you do have some control, but again, it's like farther away. Uh, and this is sort of prescribed very indirectly through dynamics and just sort of like 
understanding human emotion, like how will how would a person feel about this thing? Um, so th it can be very hard to like design up here in the aesthetic space, but it's very easy to design down here. And you sort of sort of have to like kind of hope that the dynamics you're making are going to get you, or the the mechanics you're making are going to get you the dynamics you want, which will get you the aesthetics you want. Um, so you're over here building this side. The player is way over on the other side. Like if you if you're like you know browsing Steam or like someone recommends you a game or something, like they will their recommendation will be like, oh, you should totally play this. Like the story's really cool, or like oh, like they, they have this really really cool um, like. Uh, system that you should that I think you'll like, or um, you know something like that. So they're 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 coming at it of like, um, oh like oh or another example like oh this game is really hard you'll love it. <laughs> like so they're coming at it from the the aesthetic side of like why would they want to play this game, and they then when they play it they interact with the game and like they are exercising the boundaries that are uh, the affordances and and uh, uh, constraints. That are just determined by the mechanics. So they're coming at it basically in the opposite order. So uh, I'm going to break down a game using the MDA framework. So we can actually like we've we've talked about what these things are in abstract, but this way we can actually like break down a particular game. Um, before I do that, just to check in, how are people doing? I notice uh, because it's Discord, I just have a bunch of people in stunned silence, and no one's talking in the no mic chat. Are people people feeling good? Uh, yeah, I've been able to follow. Very nice. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll take I'll take the single thumbs up emoji. <laughs> there we go. Oh yeah, taking notes. Great. Oh, awesome. Um, I will post the slides. Um, yeah. I, I, am I going too fast? That's also a, I can slow down if I'm going too fast for people. Uh, I, I'm very excited about this subject, so I sometimes get very animated when talking about it. Okay. This is good. This is good. All right. Awesome. Okay. So we're going to break down a game, um, and I'm kind of hinting at what the game is with this little emoji here. Uh, we're going to break down Telephone. Now, if you have not played Telephone before, uh, don't worry. I am going to explain in literally too much detail what the game of Telephone is and how it is played. So we're going to start by breaking down the mechanics. And like you'll, this basically just reads like a bulleted list of the rules of Telephone, because the mechanics are the rules. Um, so players stand in a single file line. The first player composes a message and whispers it to the next player. The second player recites the message to the third player, and so on, um, until it reaches the end of the line. Then the last player will speak the message aloud, and then the game is over. And some little caveats is that each player can only speak once. So like once you've delivered the message, that's it. And when a player speaks, only the next person in line can hear them. So like they're supposed to whisper it, but like you're you're not you're not allowed to like try to listen in to the, the person behind you or whatever. Um, these are the prescribed rules of the game. Like these are these are what the rules of the game telephone are. And uh, what's kind of a, as a fun aside here, oh you call it Chinese whisperer in school. Interesting. Yeah, it might have they might have had different names, but like I learned it as telephone. Um, but uh, these are the prescribed rules of the game. And as a fun aside, where's the win condition? Like some some definition of game requires there to be a win condition, and yet there there is no if x happens you win or if y happens you lose in these mechanics. I just find that interesting. Uh, just food for thought. Um, so here are the dynamics of telephone, or some of the dynamics of telephone. Um, <laughs> oh man, I said something controversial apparently. Um, so uh, the dynamics of telephone. Uh, these are observed dynamics of telephone, is what I should say. Because again, dynamics are what players do. And players could do literally anything so long as it obeys the rules. Uh, so these are what I have seen players do in telephone. But this is not an exhaustive list of all the dynamics in telephone. Um, <laughs> so players can make mistakes. And then those mistakes compound over time. Um, and as sort of a consequence of that, unfamiliar or unusual messages are more difficult. So if you choose like supercalifragilistic super expialidocious, like that, that is a very hard message. Like there's a sense of difficulty where if the message was just hello, like that's a very easy message. So there is this concept of difficulty that scales with the length and complexity of the message. 
Um, there's also this sort of suspense when you're waiting for your turn. Like if, if you're like in the middle and you hear the murmuring, like getting closer and closer to you, like you, you know, you're just sort of this excitement of like, oh man, it's like almost my turn. I'm going to hear the message and I'm going to do such a good job. Or like, or maybe you're nervous, like, oh no, I'm going to screw it up. Oh geez, I'm going to be the guy. Like everything, everything's going to go so smooth right up until it gets to me. And I'm just going to mess it up for everyone. So then, then once you've passed on the message, like once you've done your job, there's sort of this suspense of like, okay, well, I know what the message was when I got it, but like there's like four or five more people after me. I'm excited to hear like how it morphs from there. Um, so as a sort of strategy that might come out of this is that uh, the player at the start of the line might tend to choose a long and complicated message for the, the deliberate intent of it getting mangled. Um, and as what will almost always happen, <laughs> Jose says, sometimes it's fun to be that guy. Hey, I have a, I have a bullet point for you. Um, so the uh, the last player almost always ends up with a totally mangled message. I have yet to see a game of telephone where like the message got across perfectly. And even if I did, that is like the least memorable game of telephone. Like th that, it's not exciting when the message gets across successfully. So somehow, the more mangled it is, is like more fun, which is interesting. Um, <laughs> the message is going to be empty string. Um, so, uh, and, and like sometimes, I haven't actually seen this, but I totally believe it could happen just because I know how people are. Uh, some players might deliberately sabotage the message. Um, so they might like go out of their way to give the message wrong. Um, and again, these are not prescribed rules of the game. These are consequences for between how the rules are designed and how humans behave. Um, and sort of being able to think on this dynamic level is sort of being able to speculate how humans might interact when they play the game. Um, so let's talk about some of the aesthetics of Telephone. Um, so this is sort of, we're sort of categorizing, I'm sort of bucketing the aesthetics or the dynamics I already talked about. So fellowship, so the mangled message at the end is funny. And like, that's a thing that everyone gets to like enjoy. Um, and like everyone gets to like, you know, have fun in that together as like a, a thing that we all collaborated on. We all created this mingled message together. Um, and like players are sort of, generally speaking, they're working together to transmit the message. They're, they're working as a team. So there's a sort of social framework that goes with that. Um, and then I guess there's a little bit of a, an expression aesthetic of like, you know, the, the first player chooses the message. You know, the, the message they chose is something that came from their head and it's something they get to express. And like, that's, you know, they're, they're creating something that is, makes the game unique to them. Uh, and same, likewise, players make mistakes, and the types of mistakes they make are um, like unique to those specific players. Like if, I had, if you did supercalifragil supercalifragilisticexpialidocious with certain players, they might nail it, but certain players might mess it up in very specific ways that are like specific to those particular players. Um, so, uh, and then also like, you know, similarly, the way people sabotage the message if they choose to do so, the fact that they chose to do so is a form of expression and the way they sabotage it is a form of expression. And then like, I categorize this as narrative because I wasn't really sure what other uh, um, aesthetic to categorize it under. And this might be a sign that the, the list of aesthetics provided in the paper is not complete because it's like this suspense feeling before it's your turn and this suspense after the fact. I don't really know how to categorize it. I call it narrative. I don't think that quite fits. One that I don't have on the slide is um, the aesthetic of um, uh, abnegation, or what do they call it? They call it um, submission, which is game as pastime. Sorry, um, and like that is like you play the game just because you're just trying to kill time. And I think a telephone definitely falls into that category because the the secret dynamic that is not I did not describe is players are playing this rather than doing something else. Um, and that is especially significant for telephone, to me at least, because I first played telephone during a school fire drill in elementary school that went a little long. Like, so you have a bunch of kids out on the soccer field for like 30 minutes and they're, they're like, you know, they're, they're bored, they're restless, and they're seven. So you want them to like stay in a single file line and stay like focused and not like distracted. So you play telephone and it's like a great way to like, you know, to, to keep the kids in line because like now they're playing a game and like now it's important they participate and play the game. Um, so 
Um, <laughs> that's a throwback. Yeah, <laughs> I struck a chord with somebody. Um, so, um, <laughs> so how can we use MDA to actually make games? Now, I think this is the part that is going to be especially useful uh, to this group because, like, you guys do game jams, and like, um, you might, like, you might have struggled in the past with when you're participating in the game jam and like you're at the start of the jam, the theme just got announced and you're trying to like come up with what your game is. Um, I, for one, have an issue where I t tend to kind of draw a blank. Like I just kind of forget how games work and I just don't know what to make. Um, so this might provide a, like, a helpful framework to at least get started and maybe keep going once you have started. So designing by mechanics, if we just look at just the mechanical level, uh, we can just take two existing mechanics from games out in the world, like two or three or whatever, and just mash them together, just put them in dialogue with each other. Um, so you could be like, okay, well, what if we had a game that was um, a grid-based tactics game, but you control it with Tetris? Like you, you play Tetris, and when you make rows in Tetris, that like gives you moves or gives you like like attack points you can then use in this uh, this tactics game, like. These two systems are in dialogue with each other. Um, so you just like take two things, just, just mash them together. Um, or if you have one mechanic that just popped into your head, uh, you can just take that one mechanic and just lock it in and be like, okay, we're gonna make we're gonna make a game that uses this like grappling hook or something. Um, and you just lock in that mechanic and you just figure out other mechanics that will support that thing. Um, and then you just play test that with real human beings. Like th this is crucial. You can't. When I say play test, I don't mean run the game by yourself. I mean literally get another human being, put them in a chair, run the game in front of them, and take notes. Um, because it's important that you watch how human beings interact with your game. Um, and then the dynamics will follow. You'll see like how do people actually behave when they play this game. And you can either lean into those dynamics by adding mechanics that support those and incentivize those dynamics, or you can. Uh, pull back from them. And this, Sam brings up a good point, playtesting in person. I also miss playtesting in person. Although Discord screen sharing is a very powerful thing. Um, I have done many Discord playtests, and like it's almost as good as the real thing. Um, and yeah, so just any of my mechanics, you just sort of prototype until it's fun. Like that's, that, that's really what it comes down to, is you just, you just keep on iterating, and you keep on playtesting with people. Um, so with regard to um, a certain approach of designing by uh, mechanics, like you know, I, I alluded to like picking one mechanic and just locking it in. Typically, like there are some games, um, I had examples over here like Fruit Ninja, Super Hexagon, or 2048. Another example would be like Beat Saber. Um, is you just have like one mechanic that's just like, oh, like so amazing. It's just like, oh, this is like such a great mechanic. You can make a whole game about this thing. Uh, and just like, okay, we'll take that one mechanic and make a game about it. It's like, OK, that works, providing you can come up with an initial seed mechanic. And uh, the metaphor that I, I thought was like, really great for this is um, I, I, had a, I have a friend who like, is a musician. And like, he was given this piece of advice that is just not useful to him at all. But the advice was, like, listen to the music in your head and then find those notes on the guitar. And it's like, that doesn't mean anything to me because I don't hear music in my head. Like, it, doesn't, I don't, it doesn't work that way. Um, but some people, maybe it does. So like some people, like you can just like imagine like, oh, this would be an amazing mechanic. So like if, you're, if your brain works that way, more power to you. Congrats on being the next Jonathan Blow. Um, or you can just keep on building a more and more complex system until a compelling game falls out, which is what Dwarf Fortress did. Um, I don't know if that's a catch-all solution for everybody, but like it's another way to design by mechanics. You just keep on adding more and more mechanics until a game falls out. Okay. So designing by dynamics. This is like where I like this is this is the way that I work. Like this is the way that my brain works. So this is my favorite slide. Um, pick a discrete thing you want the players to do. Something you can describe in a sentence. Like you know that, that I want them to uh, accidentally kill this boss. I want them to argue with each other. I want them to like build a self-sustaining machine that plays the last part of the game for them over and over again. Um, I'm talking about Factorio, if that sentence didn't make sense. Um, teach the player how to do that thing. Um, like whether it's like, a, 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 you know, if, if like this assumes that it's like a base, basic sort of mechanic of like, um, if it's like, oh, I want them to like do this comboing system. I want them to get a, a, a 
like a 10 times combo on this encounter. It's like, okay, well, teach them how to get the combos. Teach them how the combo system works, whether through a, a strict tutorial or through just gameplay. Give them incentives to do the thing. So like this comboing system should reward them in some way. And then create situations that are very conducive to doing that thing. So if you have this comboing system, you should create encounters that in which combos are a very likely thing that will happen, and then reward them for doing the thing successfully. So this is sort of the same thing as creating incentives, but like the way to think of it is incentives come before uh, uh, rewards come after. So like incentives would, would uh, be like, you know, before they do the thing, you should hint to them that they should that this would be a good opportunity to do the thing, or like there would be some like motivation for them to do it. Whereas reward is just like they get points or they get. Uh, uh, energy or whatever, or like, you know, it gives them gold. I don't know, <laughs> whatever, whatever the reward system is for your game. Um, and then you prototype the mechanics that are inherent in that dynamic. So, so at this point, this first like bullet point here, uh, this is before you've actually like made the game. You know, you just think about like, what is the thing I want the players to do? Um, like, so it's like, a, or, you know, if it's a comboing system or like you know, among us, I want players to argue with each other. Okay, how do we do that? What are the mechanics we need to get there? So now that you have this sort of design goal, you have this dynamic you're going for, it becomes a little easier to figure out what mechanics you need to get there. So then your like, goal is to just prototype, like find the minimum set of mechanics you need to get there, build that prototype, um, and then play test it until you find the dynamic. Um, and if the dynamic sounds fun or engaging, it probably is fun and engaging. So if you can, if you can deliver on that desired dynamic. Um, so again, this is crucial. Play test with real human beings. Um, and if they, if they did the thing, then you nailed it. If they didn't do the thing, then you have to go back to the drawing board. Um, and this can also work in reverse. What if you don't want them to do the thing? Like if they, or what if they do something you don't want? Um, then you can also build mechanics that disincentivize that thing, or like don't reward that thing, as the case may be. And then designing by aesthetics, I don't have great advice for this because it's really hard. <laughs> um, so designing by aesthetics, you have to figure out what your game is about, <laughs> I guess. Like, what, what, do you, what are the reasons people will play your game? What is the player's role in this game? Um, and then, like, a little, even more, like, big brain, what is the game's role in the player's life? Why are they playing it? Are they playing it to pass pass the time? Are they playing it because it's a thing they can play with friends? Are they trying to challenge themselves? Why are they playing? Why would they want to play this game? Uh, what do you want them to take away and learn from this experience? And I say in the slide right here, or something like that. Like that, that is conceptually how one might design by aesthetics. I don't know how to do that personally. Like the, the, that is, I think how you might like, I don't know how to start rather. I think that if you had a game that you're already like working on and you already have a sense of like what the game is and how people play it and why people enjoy it you can start to think in this space but i don't think you could start a game anew on the aesthetic level um <clears throat> so some design approaches for design like starting with particular uh like on a particular level of the mda so you can start with a prototype with some mechanics like say that like you start with you know a platforming engine or something Discover a dynamic that's good. And again, to discover that dynamic, you have to do that with real people. So real people play your game, you know, your platformer game with like really basic enemies, and like they accidentally discover this like interesting thing that they can do, this interesting interaction. It's like, oh, okay, that's cool. Let's rebuild this prototype, but like with that dynamic in mind, trying to find that thing. Um, and like make that thing more be, <laughs> make that thing more be, make that thing what the game is about. Um, uh, if you're starting with a dynamic, then start with a dynamic dynamic that sounds fun out loud. Like so, think about like um, you know they uh, they comboed an attack off of three enemies, which allowed them to build up their meter so they could shoot a laser at the fourth enemy. It's like okay, that sounds fun. Or like they uh, they're going to like sneak by this first enemy and they're going to pick their weapon out from under them like without them noticing and they're going to like kill them with it or whatever it's like okay that sounds fun and interesting so it has to sound fun out loud and then build the mechanics that are essential to that dynamic 
and then play test until the dynamic happens consistently with real players. And then starting with an aesthetic, you can find dynamics that reinforce that aesthetic, which I guess you'd have to do this first level first to get there. Um, and then find the minimum mechanics needed to deliver on those dynamics again. So it's sort of the same thing with these two. Um, and then here's my work cited. This is the original paper. I can uh, link in the Discord. Oops. And then here's my Twitter and website. Um, the main takeaway I want to have for this group in particular is I really think that like designing by dynamics is sort of the way to go. That, that if you're making a game jam game, like you should start with what is a cool dynamic you want to happen and make a game where that dynamic happens. And like that, I think is, is a great way to start for a game jam game. Um, and like a great way to keep a focused vision is keeping your dynamic or dynamics at mind. Anyway, that's my talk. Thank you. Applause. Ooh. Thank you very much. That's actually a really insightful talk. It makes me wonder, like, in the past couple of games games I've been developing, like, which way did I, imp like, automatically choose to do it? Or what was yeah. my subconscious thinking like? I have found that, like, I'll think about games that I've worked on. Because, like, yeah, the, the, like, I only recently, like, wrote out this talk and actually, like, made this presentation. But, I, like, in making it, I've, I've done the same thing. I've thought back about uh, old games that I've made. And what I found is that, like, depending on... Like I, I'm either like on this level or on this level, sometimes with the same game. Like I'll just you know, like I'll think like, well, no, I was really thinking about the dynamics at that point. It's like, well, no, I was really thinking about the mechanics. Like so I think that at different phases in the design process, you're gonna like oscillate back and forth between these things. So it's not like you're not locked into one mindset. And what's also really cool about this is that like you can do this like per small things in the game. Like like, like, you can kind of do it per interaction, where it's like, I want the player to feel this for this interaction of the game, and you can you can design that by dynamic. Well, the way I just phrased it was saying by dynamic. Or you can be like, I want this mechanic to be somewhere in the game, and then design by mechanic for that mechanic. Or like, like you, get, you can go through this process, like, and on a large-scale game, like, you have to, like, go through the design process many times. The large-scale game is just, like, a, a combination of smaller games in a way, you know? Yeah, that's a good point. I'm thinking like, yeah, yeah I can turn the slides. Oh, it's, oh, it's yeah. a PPTX. I hope that's uh, <laughs> I hope that works for people. Proprietary format. No. Um, even if yeah. you don't have PowerPoint, you can always just open it up in Google Slides. Yeah, that's what I figured. Uh, it might it might mess up the formatting, but like the text is what's important. Um. Yeah, like, I, like what Andrew said is totally right. That like you can, um, like think about this on, the, on an individual level. Like for this level, like that. The, um, I I thought about this on a per level basis. Like for this level, I want you to discover this thing, or um, like Andrew, uh, you and I were talking about this earlier. Where like you had a game where the pitch was, I want you, I want the player to realize that, like this this revelation is happening. I don't want to spoil what it is, but like you're you're. You're playing a game against someone, and you find out they're cheating, like that. And that—that's a discovery you have. It's not a like the game doesn't explicitly tell you like, by the way, they're cheating. It's like that is a an experience, a revelation that the human being at the desk uh, has, or at the at the you know at keyboard, at the controller, whatever. No, no spoilers here because uh, Emily showed like a gameplay footage of that game in her talk like two weeks ago. Oh, okay. <laughs> No, but yeah, absolutely. And like, I mean, we put um, when we were chatting about this. Wait, did we lose Wyatt? No, I'm here. Oh no, you just moved your spot on the list. Um, yeah. When we were chatting about that, we put Toriel from Undertale on that slide, right? Because that's like a very yeah. like specific point in that game that's very much so designed by dynamics. Like, there's something that's like supposed to happen. Um, on accident like the player's supposed to do something on accident yeah. and it's like that's such an and interesting uh interesting thing to put in a game because uh i think people are tempted to think about games in terms of like what players could do or what players would want to do rather than like what players will end up doing on accident 
like in the there's um like there are mechanics that support that like so okay first off has anyone here desperately not want spoilers for the game undertale because if so you might want to just like i don't know like uh, cover your ears for like the next 30 seconds um it's pretty early in the game but like so there are mechanics that that support that in that like if you bring her down to like a fourth of her health bar like it <laughs> um like and then you hit her again she just like suddenly loses all of her health like it's just right. so there, there is like there is a bit of a like a, you know a, a deliberate like mechanical surprise in there not like, not only there. that the last few enemies the way to not kill them was to bring them down to like a fifth of their health bar and then spare them <laughs> mm. but uh um, Likewise, like there's very little feedback or like signposting of what you're quote unquote supposed to do in that fight. Um, so it's sort of a deliberate like lack of signposting that leads to this particular uh, dynamic. So like you can this like I mean under, uns unsurprising hot take Undertale's a pretty good game, um, <laughs> but like they they're able to like you're able to incentivize certain behavior by all like you know you can signpost and kind of hint like hey maybe you should try this thing or like you know whatever um but you can also do the opposite if you're pretty confident like okay i think i know what headspace the player is going to be when they get here i think that they're going to be thinking about this i think they're going to be looking at this thing and like and if i don't tell them anything if i just leave them to their own devices they're probably going to do this um and again there's lots of probabilities and maybes in there because dynamics are very fuzzy like that you have some players that just like like oh I see what's going on here and they just you know they do the uh, unexpected thing. Yeah, and I think I mean I think that's rewarding for players to do that, to be able to do that. Okay. Yeah, Undertale. I, I like Undertale because it's a game that uh, gives you a lot of choice but knows what you're going to do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and conversely, if you design a game not knowing what the player is going to do, then you could accidentally create like a game breaking bug or like exploit. Yeah. Like, I don't think, so. yeah, like, like, I, for okay. example, in Stellaris, you can stack hundreds and hundreds of pops on a planet that should only realistically support like 50. Uh, but because the way that they made the mechanic for overpopulation, only one pop will start dying at once. So, oh. So you can basically just pile on as many people as possible onto a planet. They all produce, but they're all starving while they do so. But only one of them actually dies per like per cycle. So you can basically just completely exploit the dynamics of the game uh, because basically because the developers just didn't anticipate it. Right. And like so. So then, like, yeah, like so, so stuff like that. I find very interesting because like. On the one hand, it's like, oh well, they clearly the developers didn't and anticipate this. So, or like at least that's what I don't know if they explicitly said they that like this is a bug. But like, on the other hand, it's like this is the way the game is. So this is the way the game is played. So like, you know, it's sort of like death of the author. Like, you know, it, the game is not broken. The game is what it is. I mean, maybe I'm being too philosophical, but. Oh, definitely. Like, it's a very broken but very fun way to play the game is to do that. So I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing, but it's just an observation. Yeah, and there, totally. There's a balance there, too, where it's like, if it's hard enough to find, I think it enhances the game in a lot of ways and in a lot of cases. Yeah. Um, and so long as it's... I love... I love watching speedruns where they're like, okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to like wiggle the cartridge a little bit. <laughs> like, you know, just something like <laughs> totally. Right. Yeah. Like, something... uh, you know, beating, uh, beating Super Mario 64 with one half A press, right? Like, <laughs> like the, the fact that those percent. features exist in the game aren't detracting from 99.99% yeah. of players like interactions with the game. Um, and and if anything, they add to the experience for like for those other players, like for right. the, that one percent. I just wanted to add something. Um, I believe in Breath of the Wild, uh, there was some some there were some like bugs or something that the QA testers found out. Like you could push a a boat by using magnesis on like a metal sword or something. You could just push it endlessly, or you could fly with. Uh, with two minecarts stacked or something, 
and uh, I forget, I think the creative director or someone uh, said, uh, if, I mean, if just, we should probably just remove uh, bugs like that if they hurt the player's experience. So, you know, they, they left that stuff in. Right. right. What are, what are bugs, but interaction preserving, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Cause like, cause yeah, like, the, like the way those systems work together, it makes sense that it would work that way. And like, yeah, like I could see if it's like, okay, well, if it accidentally gives you like a million velocity and just sends you like clipping through a wall, then okay, yeah, then that's not good. But if it's just like a way to make the boat go fast, then, you know, like, yeah, it's just that's players being clever. Like, um, another example of from like not, uh, not game dev necessarily, but like it's sort of, it, you know, if you think about just any any system as a potential to be considered a game, uh, I heard a this is more, I just like the story too, so I just like retelling it. But like, uh, there was a story I heard of a, a student who like did a study abroad in um, like I think it was in India, and he went visited a bookstore and he found like that they were selling textbooks and including the textbooks he needed for his course next quarter. Um, and um, this, this series of emoji, emoji. Um, but uh, <laughs> so he saw, like, you know, in, in this bookstore, there were textbooks he needed for next quarter, but they were like way, way cheaper, you know, because it's in, you know, it, it's it's in India, it's international edition, it's like way cheaper, like on the order of like twenty dollars for what would be like two hundred dollar book. Um, and so he like calls up his friend. Uh, who's also taking the class that he needs is like, hey, so I can get you the book for next quarter. How many do you want? <laughs> so what he ends up doing is like, you know, it's like he buys like 50 copies of this textbook. He buys an additional bag that he has checked luggage uh, of this textbook with the intent to just sell it to other students when he gets back to campus at a slight markup from what he bought it at, but still cheaper than what the publisher sells it at. Um, because it's like, it's the same book, just cheaper. Um, and when the publisher caught wind of this, they tried to sue him. And in court, the judge threw it out because, and I quote, that's commerce. <laughs> that is that is how the system works. That is, so like, this is a way to say like, this is not, the system is broken. The system is working as intended. This is just a clever player. Crickets. I think it's a cool story. I like that story a lot it's too. Very funny, yeah. <laughs> it's I, I, yeah. I, I find it very vindicating as a student who had paid like upwards of three hundred dollars for a textbook. Yeah, you can't convince me that you know university textbook sales is not a game. <laughs> can, it is can, a game you that you are losing. The loser <laughs> <business, laughs> is playing. Buy a first party copy of a textbook unused. Um, I just, uh, I was going to say one more thing. Uh, mm -hmm. This wasn't really related to exactly what we were talking about, just, uh, but um, I remember seeing a video by uh, Game Maker's Toolkit. I'm going to see if I can find it, but uh, it was called like the games that designed themselves. Yes. And uh, they were like. I'm bringing it up. Yeah, I found it. I will link it in the chat. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, it was kind of like they were making yeah that that video, and it was like you know the devs were making a game, and then they realized, hey, this mechanic is pretty fun. Let's make a game out of it. Uh, I don't know it if it's covered. Really in, I haven't seen the video in a while. Yeah, but, uh, I don't know if it's covered in that video, but there's um the origin story for Untitled Goose Game um is really fascinating. That essentially you know they were making this like goofy prototype where you like you play as a goose and like. They, they didn't really know what the game was going to be. Uh, like they had like a rough idea of what the game would be. But then what they did is when they were programming the, uh, the IK, the inverse kinematics, where like, uh, which is, I don't totally understand what IK is, but it's essentially dynamic animations. It's like animations that are dictated through code. And it was the IK that allowed the goose 
to look up at the, like if there's a human nearby, the goose will look up at the human's head and the human will look down at the goose. They'll kind of like make eye contact. And like, the, so like they had, you know, the, the human was like patrolling around, they're on the patrol route and the goose got near and the human stops in their tracks and just looks at the goose and the goose looks at the human and there's just this pause. And in that moment, they were like, we have to make this into like, this is this is an amazing moment. Like this, this like emotional tension of there's the goose and there's the human. We need to make a game out of this. I want the player to feel this interaction. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, I, I need, I need to show the world this. <laughs> um, if we're talking about games that designed themselves, I think a super interesting example is Tic Tac Together, which is the game Jose and I are working on right now, uh, mm -hmm. for a very different reason, uh -huh. which is that Tic Tac Together, like has a very simple set of rules in how it works. And like, we were reminiscing on like the process of making it the other day when we were like, we did not have that many game design decisions to make while making this game. Like, it's a lot of work with like UI and juice and all that stuff. But it's like, the game design decisions were mostly like, this is how it should work because that's yeah. how like the game works. Like, but what if you have a tie on one of the micro boards? It's like, oh, okay, well, it should be a star. <laughs> like, right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. Those are like the few decisions that we, that were made. I, I was gonna say that we made, but that Jose made before I joined the project, even like, and then like, it all just like from there has just been like flowing out of that, which is really interesting. It's like very much so, like mechanical simplicity, and then like building things that like cause like cause the dynamics that we noticed happen out of that mechanical simplicity like have more like oomph to them yeah like that that is definitely like a the find it find the music in your head type of design where like jose just had a really great idea one time and just like made the game that was that idea a end of list <laughs> like i was gonna say like like you had mentioned, you're like you're someone who designs very much by dynamic. I tend to be the type of person who designs by mechanic, where I just I find a thing that I think is interesting, I build it, and sometimes it happens to be interesting, and I like lean into it. And most of the time, it doesn't, <laughs> um, and then I just scrap it. But like I was like I was just looking at the list of my games because like uh, Camera had mentioned before, and I was like. Uh, a lot of my stuff tends to be like puzzle games because mm. those tend to be like you design one interesting mechanic and then you just see how many different ways you can like bend it and then even uh, oh good yeah you know, I was gonna say like I, I think that's sort of like you're you're kind of on both levels there because like you're you for the core gameplay itself it's you're designing by mechanics but then when you're designing an individual puzzle like you're thinking about like what revelation do I want the player to have about the way the mechanics work. Or some, something to that effect, right? That's true. Yeah, yeah. Like, well, and I think cool you action? have to design by dynamics if you're making a game. Like, That's true. Yeah. Like, there's there are cases when you don't like if you want it to really just be like a real fuck you to the player, right? Or like mm -hmm. if you're designing a jigsaw puzzle, um, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> like that, if that is. Like, if you have one major mechanic that you want the entire game to be based off of. I feel like you can design by mechanic. And I think, or, well, but you still just, then like you still need yeah. to think about how the player discovers that over time mm -hmm. and like how they interact with it. Like, yeah. if if basically like if it's interactive, like like dynamics exist because it's interactive media, and like yeah. if you want it to be a like a piece of media that needs to be interactive and is special because it's interactive, uh, which if you don't want it, like don't make a game. Uh, then, like, like you, you do need to think about dynamics at some point, I think. And, yeah. like, I mean, even if not by name, like, I think you, you naturally sort of think, what will a player, how will the player use this? Yeah. And I think, like, the, 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 um, the under, something you need to think about is, like, whether you start with designing by mechanics or designing by dynamics or even aesthetics, at some point you have to touch the other areas, right? What, yeah. What that kind of analogy is really strong for is, like, where you start, right? Like, yeah, whether you start I, I, with like yeah. a, a rule, a rule set, or kind of like a feeling, or you know something like that. Right? Yeah. Alternatively, you could just but, make a sandbox and just let the players take the mechanics and do whatever they want with them. But I, I think that's so like that's Gary's mod. A, yeah, that's not a very compelling experience. Like I mean, like Gary's mod is fun 
for like five minutes and like you know but like you know you have mods and stuff like that that make gary's mod fun but like at that point i would argue those are separate games they happen to be running in gary's mods executable but they're different games yeah and it's like the the stuff about sandboxes that are cool is are like things you can do with them that, like, like you, you still are like you still at some point are expecting the player to use the sandbox to to do something. Oh yeah, of course, yeah. And like, or like at the very least, like needing to understand how to use the sandbox, like and learning that in some way. Yeah, I guess like, I was mostly just saying like at the very basic sense, if you really wanted to do mechanics only, that's kind of possible. Wouldn't be right? Fun. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and it is it is possible to not have to think about the other ones. Um, it's tough though, because you're gonna have a game if you only choose mechanics. You're gonna have a game that has no control over like how the player interacts with the game, right? I don't know. And how the player experiences kind of the game. Like Dwarf Fortress just kind of throws you off the deep end. Like here, here's this entire simulated world, and you have like you have buttons that can control it, but I'm not gonna really be able to tell you what they are. <laughs> like. Yeah. Like that's that's an experience, right? It's like that's a controllable experience in some sense. Like y y part of the experience is learning how to like manage the game, mm. and so like that's a that's a specific design choice to just not tell players from the beginning what things do. Tutorials are simply a dynamic. Yeah. They kind of are. But you could choose to not include the tutorial, which is in and of itself a dy dynamics decision. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Well, the only decisions you ever make are mechanics decisions. But, like, you, you might make mechanics decisions that are specifically tailored toward a dynamic. And so you have to think about exactly. that dynamic, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Words... Unless you're super lucky and you're just, like, tweaking knobs randomly, not looking at the Exactly. Screen. Like, this is... This is my this is my initial thing where it's like, unless you're making something that's non-interactive, like tweaking out randomly. Did you mean League of Legends? How people are going to be using it? Yeah, you could be yeah. the Riot Balance team, just tweaking mechanics <laughs> randomly, not knowing what the heck's going to happen. <laughs> uh, yeah, like something that that I mean, I, I realize like because I used one particular paper that used this particular nomenclature, like. It's easy to get kind of like locked in on like these are what these words mean and this is like the yeah. correct like usage because like you know and like I, I do explicitly say in the presentation you control mechanics you don't control dynamics and aesthetics i think that like i mean because I, I remember i was talking to emily about this and she was saying that like well you do control dynamics and aesthetics through the mechanics so it's like you know it, it's sort of a a, a, a you know, a pedantic kind of phrasing of like, you know, you can make decisions in the dynamic levels. You, the way you make those decisions is by changing mechanics. So like, it's, yeah, I, I just, yeah, it sort of gets, it gets kind of bike shetty of like, we're just, <laughs> we're, we're just arguing about what the words mean rather than arguing about the concepts behind them. Yeah, I've also talked to Emily about this and Emily's opinion is that like, people should not use MDA as much as they do. Like yeah. it's useful. Like, it, it, she's her, her opinion is it's useful for analyzing games, but like, if you try to like create some rigid development process around it, like, you can like really get lost in like the terminology and stuff. And it's like sometimes you need to just make a game. Yeah, like, and that, that's I think like, I think the takeaway from this talk really is like. Not like, hey, you should read up on MD MDA because that will like help you become a better game designer. It's like, hey, you should if you got any insight out of this talk, you should just take that insight and just kind of forget the rest. Like just you know, like the, the you know um, if it, if this makes it easier for you to like get started in a game jam, it's like great, that's good enough. That is, that's all you needed to get out of this. Absolutely. It's a bunch of tools that real people have used to think about how to design things and it's like just like put those in your toolkit now and use them next time you need to do it i um i was talking to andrew about this before but like um there's i got the, the a book called rules of play game design fundamentals i can link the amazon link. it's quite expensive but it's a really good book um and like in the first chapter the first couple of chapters they talk about 
three different kinds of play and like they map basically one-to-one -one with MDA. Like not, not, not quite one-to-one, -one, but like, yeah, it's like, um, uh, I, I can't like bring it up offhand, but like, um, you know, so, so like the fact that MDA happens to taxonomize these things does not mean like this is the only way to categorize these things or, or like this is the right way or anything like that. Mm -hmm. One thing I've been thinking about like throughout this talk is just thinking about like uh, like rocket jumping and surfing and source games like those took yeah. years to discover but they're like really fun and were completely unintentional uh, but when people found out about it they found out how to turn it into basically something that's not even like the original game at all and were just like it's fun we'll do it uh, and eventually <laughs> I've even seen like some like rocket jump and surf maps that are combined together so it's a hundred percent made up of things that uh, the original developers never intended to have happen. Yeah, like, huh? Yeah, that's interesting. So, like, it's because it is like in. Um, I guess it's very in the spirit of like Valve in general because they're very they're very pro mods. Yeah. Um, of like people discovered and curated their own experience that they like out of this thing. And like that's the game they play, rather than the game that you made. Like so many of Valve's projects are just people are like, "Hey, what if we took Half Life and then did this with it?" And Valve was like, "I like your line of thinking. Come and make that into a full game." Right, so I mean, to I some actually, extent, the I game that anyone ever game. plays so. is not the game that you made, but the game that they were playing. Thanks sure. you all for coming to my talk. I got I gotta head out. Uh, it's yeah. nice chatting yeah. with you. Nice Thank you. Thanks for giving talking it. Talking at you a lot. Yeah. Uh, hi, Wyatt. And have a good week. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.